Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk, some schools haven't had a regular week of classes since before Thanksgiving. I walked in high school over a mile in the snow to get to school. You know, it's, it sounds like one of those stories back in my day. How do schools make the decision to close? And as the missed days stack up, what are kids losing out on? HPV causes 70% of cervical cancers. We didn't know anything about the vaccine when Kristen got sick. Matter of fact, I'm not sure if I knew about the vaccine until probably after we lost her. And Indiana's own Nick Gepper is introducing slope style to the Olympics. We'll take you to his hometown and sit down for a conversation with his parents. Those stories now look at this week's headlines right now on Indiana News Desk. Hello, I'm Joe Wren and welcome to Indiana News Desk. Well, the big story that keeps resurfacing each week is the winter weather that won't seem to let up. Some parts of the state saw nine or more inches of snow this week and more is likely on the way this weekend. This winter is breaking records for snowfall and low temperatures, but also for school cancellations. Some schools haven't seen a regular week since before Thanksgiving. Sarah Whitmire reports on how that's impacting districts and why some parents are starting to worry. It's a little after nine on Wednesday morning and Will and his brother Sam are sledding down the hills in their front yard. The icy glaze on top of the white powder makes for good sledding. Their mom, Megan Eller, says they'll stay out and play until they get too cold. They'll go inside for a bit and then likely come out again later. They will end up going outside at least once or twice today to play in the snow because they need to go out and move around because otherwise they'll be running laps in the house and <laughs> um, they'll they'll play. They'll. My older son loves to draw, so he'll be drawing a lot. We will go through a lot of paper today. <laughs> In a sense, they have a routine for their disrupted routine because they've been down this path so many times. The Eller boys are in kindergarten and first grade at University School in Bloomington. Class has been canceled five times this year, and as of yesterday, they've had nine delays. Today, they're excited. It's a novelty. There's all this snow, and they'll get to go out and play. I know right, especially right after winter break, they'd been home for two weeks, and so by then they were like, I want to go do something. Travel to nearly any district in Indiana and it's the same story. 12 cancellations in Brown County, 10 at Clay Community Schools, 9 in Fort Wayne. Some of those days haven't been for snow and ice, but for extreme cold. Lots of folks are beginning to take issue with the number of days their children are missing class. This is Master Control at WTIU where all our delays and closings come in. Just looking at our numbers for the past five years, you see that we've had significantly more cancellations this year than in previous years. This year is truly different. Temperatures have broken records. We had the coldest January we've had since 1979 and January was the second snowiest on record. This week, much of the state set another record for the most snowfall in one day. This latest blast dumped six and a half inches in Howard County. School superintendent Tracy Cadell can't remember a week when his students had a full week of class with no closings and no delays. I believe it's been uh, before Thanksgiving. <laughs> so it's been a while. The buses sat parked again this week. School was canceled for the eighth time this year. I've been a superintendent now for this is my 13th year and I cannot recall any winter quite as severe as this one. 
Cadell says in the mornings he and other district officials always try to find ways to keep the schools open before making the call. They have to consider things such as road conditions. Can students who are driving make it in safely? And can buses navigate the rural roads? They don't have to worry about their buses starting because they sit plugged in to engine warmers. It's just communicating with lots of other people and, and trying to make a good decision and sometimes you don't. I mean we've certainly had delays when we should have closed and, uh, and those are unfortunate because every day is different. All the delays and closings are impacting curriculum. Cadell's school district moved around its grading periods and midterm schedule while warning that more cancellations could lead to further schedule changes. Cadell's also among the district leaders who've been issuing appeals to the state to extend the testing window for the high stakes I-STEP exam. These winter months, particularly January and February, are an important time for I-STEP prep. When you count the number of days that we've lost and the two hour delays, we've lost two weeks of instructional time. And that's going to impact some children, there's no doubt about it. Members of the State Board of Education this week did vote to extend the I-STEP window so teachers have more time to prepare kids. They'll have about a week more than originally scheduled. When the test results come back, I don't think it'll take a rocket scientist uh, to, to forecast that if for some reason the results aren't what they thought they were, the first suspect will be winter weather. Um, but at this point, I, d I don't know what else can be done. Districts still have to make up the days they canceled class. The state waived two days during the polar vortex, January 6th and 7th. But districts that have applied for waivers for other canceled days are still waiting to see. 72% of our parents said they did not want to come to school or have their kids come to school on Saturdays. Um, unfortunately, we still might have to do that. Back in Bloomington, Megan Eller is just taking it all in. She's from Chicago and says this whole experience is new to her. I walked in high school over a mile in the snow to get to school. You know, it's, it sounds like one of those stories back in my day, but I, I did that. So it, it's just very different here because it is so rural. There are a lot of people out on these windy country roads. Sarah Whitmire joins us for more. You mentioned in the piece that the schools are waiting to hear back about these waivers. Uh, what are they going to do? Yeah, nothing has been decided yet. There was a State Board of Education meeting yesterday, and Superintendent Ritz was pretty clear in her message. She basically said, we need to offer you some help, we get it, but I'm not willing to let you off the hook for those for that loss of instructional time. Those kids need to be in class for uh, 180 days a year. Um, some districts have had a couple days waived already, so they're down to 178 days. But she's saying, we're willing to work with you, but you've got to get that class time in. These schools are in a tough place because it's only February 7th. We still have, I mean, we, we've been known to have snow, bad snow in March. It's a long way to go. A lot of winter yeah. left ahead. And I think Superintendent Ritz is really saying we're, real, we're willing to work with you on it. You know, in Indiana right now, you can't add time onto a school day and, in effect, bank that. So traditionally what you've always had to do is tack it on at the end of the school year or maybe on a Saturday or something. But what Superintendent Ritz said yesterday is let's look at giving schools the option that they could add an hour on to each day and bank that time as a way to make up those days. Now you have to tell me about this really interesting Harvard study that came out. Yeah, very interesting, interesting conclusion. Tell yeah, us about basically it. Basically, saying that if 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 kids do miss school because of inclement weather, it's not detrimental. They said what was worse is if you tried to hold school when the weather was bad, because then naturally some kids aren't going to come. They're not going to be able to get there, and then the teacher is going to spend a lot of time catching these kids up, and no one they're not on the same page anymore. So it's better, they say, just to cancel class because schools are ready and prepared for situations like that. That's interesting. Well, and ice steps used to be in the fall, so didn't have to worry about this before. Right, I think that was the 2009-2010 school year. They moved it to the spring, so now we're dealing with this weather. The idea was they'd be tested on what they just learned. Yeah, very interesting. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for Thanks. that. And now for news headlines, we go over to Alex Dierkman, who has an update on this week's top stories. Thank you, Joe. Nothing happened to the marriage amendment this week that defines marriage as only between a man and a woman, but starting Monday, HJR 3 arrives in the Senate looking very different than when it first started. 
Gone is the measure's second sentence, which bans civil unions. The House took it out, which would also restart the ratification process, potentially putting the amendment on the ballot, not this fall, but in 2016. Governor Mike Pence is calling on the Senate to reinsert the second sentence and end the debate on the issue this year. The U.S. Senate approved a new version of the Farm Bill this week, with both of Indiana's senators voting in favor of the bill. The measure, which cuts nearly $1 trillion in spending, comes after partisan fighting delayed passage of the bill for nearly four years. The legislation gets rid of direct payments to farmers while increasing crop insurance and cuts $8 billion from food assistance programs. President Obama signed the bill into law today. Purdue University officials are accepting public comment on ways to improve the university's emergency preparedness plan after last month's fatal shooting. Purdue President Mitch Daniel says the initial examination of the events surrounding the death of Andrew Bolt indicates an excellent response from law enforcement. For the most part, the university's text alert system worked as planned and the majority of students, faculty and staff responded to the shelter in place order appropriately. But Daniel says there's always room for improvement and lessons to be learned. Governor Mike Pence is asking President Obama to take steps to ease the propane shortage. Several governors, including Pence, sent the president a letter calling on the administration to take any possible steps to increase propane supplies. The governor last week announced new steps to ease the propane shortage in Indiana, including increasing the financial assistance available to low-income Hoosiers. And Hoosiers can now file their taxes, but if you're expecting a tax return, you might have to wait a little longer this year. And so what happened is with the 16-day government shutdown last fall, um, you know, the federal workers were, were not coming in for three weeks. And so basically it significantly delayed the, the update of all the computer systems, uh, software, and so forth. Rago says that means employers were not able to get their tax forms out as quickly this year, pushing the entire tax filing process back a couple of weeks. An effort to require some abortion clinic doctors to report their name to the State Department of Health is moving through the legislature. Under the measure, backup physicians would have to provide information showing they're qualified to work at the abortion clinics. That information would then be made available to the public. Planned Parenthood officials say they're concerned the rules will make doctors vulnerable to harassment. Half of all returning Hoosier Reserve and National Guard members show symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, but fewer than half of those seek treatment. Legislation the Senate approved Tuesday would direct the State Department of Health to do a thorough examination of the treatment options provided to Hoosier veterans. The bill now heads to the House. State transportation crews are working 24 hours a day to fill in potholes on the county and city level. Crews are also working overtime to fix their roads, and it's cutting into their budgets. When you have this much freezing and thawing over um, what's now been several months stretch of time, it just takes a toll on your entire road inventory. Some cities, including Bloomington, use what's called a hot box to melt old asphalt and reuse it to cover up the holes. And Joe, they say that saves them a lot of money. Well, I think folks have to be extra patient this road construction season. <laughs> They're going to have to be. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. The number of girls in Indiana who received the HPV vaccine is increasing, but it's still well below the rate of other vaccinations. State Impact explains how property taxes affect school budgets and why some districts are worried they may not be able to pay for a bus service or a building repairs. And an Indiana skier is in Sochi to compete in a new Olympic sport. All these stories right after this. We believe in the excitement of exploration, that life offers each of us adventures that are ours for the taking. We believe that children are born explorers who need trusted guides on their journeys of discovery. We believe in breaking new ground and in challenging assumptions that important questions deserve to be explored deeply, fairly, and honestly. And we believe that who you are and where you come from should never stand in the way of what you want to be. This is who we are. This is what we believe. This is PBS. 
Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Indiana sees nearly 250 cases of cervical cancer a year. There's a vaccine for the virus that causes cervical cancer that was introduced seven years ago, but Indiana's vaccination rate for that virus still lags behind other states. Josh and Lynn reports on why rates remain low for a cancer that doctors say is almost completely preventable. Kristen Forbes graduated from Indiana University, Purdue University in 2007 with a degree in business. She had a job right out of school and she was excited about starting her life on her own. Four weeks after graduation, her right ankle swelled up. And that's when the journey and the fight began with cervical cancer. And we buried her a year later on June 1st, 2008. She had multiple surgeries, she had chemo, she had radiation, several types of radiation, but it was so advanced, it was stage 3C when they first uh, diagnosed it. And so it was, even though we didn't want to admit it to ourselves, it was, the survival rate for that of initial diagnosis was pretty small. Three months after Kristen's death, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved the vaccine Gardasil a second time for the prevention of human papillomavirus, or HPV. HPV causes 70% of cervical cancers and has recently been linked to some types of oral cancer. We found out very few people know anything about the HPV illness itself, human papillomavirus. Very few people know its connection to several cancers, and very few knew that there was a vaccine available and a safe one. In 2012, Indiana's HPV vaccination rate among teenage girls was 35%. That's low compared to the rate of other vaccinations. So the question is, why are the HPV vaccination numbers so low in Indiana, seven years after it was approved? One factor is easy to point to. The HPV vaccine is not mandated for public school attendance, and a lot of parents might not know it exists. So they're not anti-vaccine or concerned about HPV vaccine so much as it hasn't been re recommended. Zimmet and Forbes also say that expense and convenience can be barriers. You need three doses of Gardasil to have immunity, and it runs about $130 per dose. How are doctors and clinics dealing with this? Public health nurse Jane Keyes says the Vigo County Health Clinic has greatly improved its completion rates for all three doses of Gardasil by sending out postcards and phone call reminders to parents before each appointment. That the importance of is, is and when you say it like it's, it prevents cervical cancer and you tell the facts, the truth, then they're more adamant at getting it done. The clinic is also covered by the CDC's Vaccine for Children program, which defrays the high cost of the HPV vaccine for patients who are on Medicaid or underinsured. Cost and lack of awareness paint only part of the picture, however. Some critics have raised the fear that the vaccination for HPV, which is a sexually transmitted disease, could increase promiscuity among teenagers. However, several studies have since debunked that assertion. And then there's the question about the vaccine's safety. In my opinion, when we're dealing with vaccines, with the known uh, risk of death, permanent disability, I can't guarantee you if I were to give you an HPV injection today that you will not be the one that will die from that. I can't guarantee you that. Wagler is a nurse and a volunteer with the Indiana Coalition for Vaccine Choice. The group's members are concerned about safety and full disclosure of any problems with the drugs. She points to the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System run by the CDC. I would say last time I looked, over 10,000 um, adverse events other than death reported associated with the HPV vaccine. Language on the VAERS website cautions that a report does not prove a vaccine caused the adverse event. The CDC encourages patients and doctors to report any bad reactions around the time of a vaccination, regardless of cause. What I would hope people realize is that it's really important that we, that when it comes to policy, health policy, the practice of health care, that we don't base that on individual stories, but we base that on a lot of individual stories. Indiana's vaccination rate is actually higher than in previous years, and advocates like Kirk Forbes are optimistic that those will keep increasing. Vaccinate Indiana, which is Indiana Vaccination uh, Coalition. Forbes has started a foundation in his daughter's name dedicated to educating doctors and parents about the HPV vaccine. Somebody came to me and said, we have a vaccine here to protect your child from a cancer. Would you like it? Absolutely. And we should mention the HPV vaccine isn't just for girls. The FDA has recently approved the Gardasil to be administered to boys who can be carriers of HPV. 
February should be a key month for state education officials as they retool Indiana's most basic expectations for students. We now turn to state impact education reporter Kyle Stokes. Kyle, what's the timeline for this rewrite of the state's academic well, standards? Well, we hear a lot about April, Joe. The State Board of Education hopes to have a draft ready for consideration by April and final academic standards by July. And we should just pause here and say, this is a big deal. It can impact what happens in every classroom around the state on a daily basis, and it's already been a very political process as lawmakers have balked at Indiana's plans to use nationally crafted standards known as the Common Core. State board members have asked teams of educators and subject matter experts to review the standards starting around Valentine's Day. As, the controvers as controversial as the Common Core aligned standards have been, state board members may still select standards that look a lot like them at the end of this review process, but the state's previous academic standards standards are also up for consideration. Governor Mike Pence this week kept mum on how he'd like to scale back the state's tax on business equipment, saying he'd still like to negotiate with state lawmakers, but he thinks the time is right to slash the tax. But the tax they're proposing to cut is a kind of property tax, and some school districts have already seen big dings to their property tax revenues. School districts use that money to essentially pay for their mortgage, for their credit card, or for their buses, or for building repairs. And they're losing that money because of a state-mandated cap on the amount of property taxes local governments can collect. And these property tax caps have cost schools a total of $245 million in property tax revenues last year. And this map shows where most of that money was lost. The darker the district, the deeper the hit to a school district's budget. And you can see most districts, because they're kind of in a lighter color here, didn't lose that much. More than two-thirds of districts in the state lost less than 5% of their property tax revenues. But in these darker districts, the losses were bigger. A handful of districts lost more than half of their property tax revenues, like the Muncie Community Schools you see here, more than 70% lost. And you've heard about cuts in Muncie to the school's busing budget. And geography is a big story in the property tax issue. Most of the losses to the caps have occurred in incorporated areas. That's because property owners have one more layer of government to pay their taxes to their city or their town. And we know that property taxes are a topic that makes people's heads spin. So here's a video that we put together explaining how property taxes factor into school budget and explains the impact of those caps using only Dixie cups and a coffee pot. And Joe, you can find that right now along with more on the proposed business equipment tax cut on our blog. And Joe, I promised you that it's a heady subject, but that video is actually kind of fun. I had a lot of fun putting it together. It looks great. Can't wait to see it. Thanks, Absolutely. Kyle. A new sport is being included in the Winter Olympics. It's called Ski Slope Style. At its most basic level, it's skiing with tricks. As it's become more popular, one skier from Indiana has become somewhat of a spokesman for the sport. Explaining what it is and how it's changing, Gretchen Frazee reports he's now in Sochi and hoping to bring home the gold. 19-year-old Nick Gepper grew up skiing here at Perfect North Ski Slopes in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, just a few miles west of Cincinnati. It's not the kind of place you expect a major skier to come out of. I talked to a couple of uh, nationally recognized coaches and they said to me, Mr. Gepper, you have three strikes against you. And I said, what's that? And they said, uh, he's from the Midwest, number one. Number two, he's from the Midwest. And number three, he's from the Midwest. But Nick Gepper was determined. Perfect North Slope manager Tim Dahl says he's been watching Nick ski since Nick was 12 years old. He says Nick would come out every day there was snow on the ground and ski for hours. Everybody kind of gets a little chuckle out of the Midwestern guy coming from a, a ski area with 400 foot of vertical drop. Uh, but, you know, that's a, that's a great thing, and that was a, an advantage for him, that he could get out here on a daily basis and make laps after laps. Gepper still skis at Perfect North when he comes home, but he now spends most of his time at larger slopes on the east and west coasts. When he was 11 years old, Gepper won first place in an amateur competition and started getting sponsors. He's quickly become the athlete to watch. Just two weeks ago, he won the gold medal in the X Games and he's favored in the Olympics. But in an interview with Ball State University before he left for Sochi, Gepper said some in his sport aren't thrilled about being in the Olympics, even though it means the sport and its athletes are gaining international attention. 
the foundation of our sport was, you know, we were kind of rebels and we wanted to break away from mogul skiing and um, kind of the regimented, you know, the rules and the um, restrictions. But, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, controversy, I guess, within the industry because now that it's in the Olympics, there's this stereotype that, you know, everyone who's going to the Olympics is just turning into um, like robots. Even if there are some people who question whether Gepper and other slope-style athletes should compete in the Olympics, Gepper's family say they're behind him 100 percent. Nick's mother, father, and three siblings are making the trip to Sochi, and his dad says the trip will be well worth it, no matter what the outcome. We take this one day at a time. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, and we're just going to enjoy it while we can. The Olympic ski slope style competition is being held Thursday, where Gepper will compete against 32 other athletes from 15 different countries. And an Indianapolis delegation is home after spending a few days in New York and New Jersey to see how the Super Bowl was handled there and to get ideas for a bid to host the 2018 game. The group says what the league is looking for is changing and the experience offered insight into what is expected of a host city. And one idea they've offered is expanding activities from the downtown circle. Indianapolis is competing against New Orleans and Minneapolis for the game. And guess who's reporting for spring training? Pitchers, catchers. Spring training coming up, it's the best time of year, the post-Super Bowl lull before baseball. So a little bit of warmth in this 16-degree air. would like some warm weather. <laughs> That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news in southern Indiana throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. And by WTIU members. Thank you.